Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. My name is Quinn Castling. I'm the VP of Block Therapy. And of course, we have Deanna Hansen, the founder of Block Therapy. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the importance of the feet. You may have even heard of the phrase, death starts in the feet. And we talk a lot about the importance of doing a fascia decompression technique or block therapy directly in the feet and how that can literally impact your entire body from your health to your alignment. And I really understand this, this well from the perspective of weight training or really doing any activity because if your base foundation's off, then that's going to cause issues up the chain. So you actually just came back from a really cool yoga retreat in, is it Sayulita? I think so. Sayulita, <laughs> Sayulita. Uh, but it's about an hour away from Puerto Vallarta. Yes. And that was like a pretty intense training. And you had, well, you learned a lot about the feed from a different perspective of a yoga master. So share a little bit your perspective on the importance of keeping your feet healthy, the alignment, the fascia, and what you learned on your trip. Awesome. Thank you, Quinn. Um, so first of all, just understanding that, of course, the feet have 26 bones. That off, like right off the start, that's impressive because, I mean, you think of the size of them. You think that your femur bone, your whole thigh is one bone and there's mm. 26 bones in the feet. So what that means, though, is they have this incredible ability to adapt to the terrain when we're walking, but they also have an incredible ability to fall out of alignment if we're not conscious of their positioning under our bodies and how to support them. So because the calves and the feet are the furthest from the diaphragm, the engine of the body, this is where the fascia will hold them out of alignment with the most incredible force. So as we go through time and we continue to fall into these grooves and patterns that the fascia creates from unconscious breath and unconscious alignment, the feet really become the harbiters of what's going on up the chain. So it's, it's fascinating because if you've got low back pain, frozen shoulder, you have migraines, you're struggling with your size and shape, your feet are going to be the number one thing in my view as to what's holding us out of alignment, stopping us from making the gains that we want. So the calves as well, because of course the fascia wraps around the calves and then manipulates the feet as well. But it really is this understanding of how to position all of the bones properly. And we've, we've spent so much time in our membership. We have that pronator corrector series and we do a lot of work between the toes. And I was so happy to go to this retreat and to also see how much emphasis there is on the toes because they're actually the eyes of the mm -hmm. body. You know, if, if you didn't have toes and you just had basically these clubs to walk on, think of how you'd be walking. There'd be instability. When we grip properly, we're literally supposed to be pushing off from these toes, yet so many people have toes that um, are angled over one another or they're twisted. So they're not really getting into the ground and that's manipulating how we move with every step and how the fascia is going to wind from that foundation all the way up the chain. So what's awesome is though how we can actually create change to the feet at a very rapid pace. And one of the things that we do in that pronator corrector series is we take the feet and we put the finger between each one of the toes and we press down and we hold for that minimum of three minutes because we want to undo the fascia pattern that has been wrapped around the toes so that we can create a new alignment and then strengthen them. So for everybody out there listening, if you do nothing else for your body, besides the breath, of course, because that's always the most important thing from our perspective. But if you take that time, if you're watching a TV show and you put pressure three minutes between each one of your toes, and you're literally like my fingers here, just pressing down and holding, and you want to get to the point where there's a little bit of pain, but as long as your breath allows. Mm. If you do that between each digit, when you stand up, you're going to notice how incredibly different your feet feel, the mobility in your feet, how when you're walking, you can actually dorsiflex that foot better to place that heel down. So when people struggle and they're shuffling their feet, it's because partly the tibia has been wrapped around out of alignment. It's moved, it's migrated too far forward onto the foot. And again, all of those bones are getting twisted and manipulated. And we're walking on these things that don't have that real recognition of the ground. And energy travels from the ground up into the body. So if we don't have the feet properly planted on the ground, we're also not getting that life force from the earth mm. into the body, as well as being able to dissipate that traumatic energy that can occur 
through life's experiences out of the body. Absolutely. Because even in our BTU workshop that we hosted here a few weeks ago, it was really cool because you taught all of us how to integrate the paddle between the toes as well. And wow, was that intense. But I think everybody in the room noticed a huge change in their feet and alignment by focusing just on the toes and in the feet. And you also mentioned, this was really cool. So there's a whole practice of reflexology. Yes. And the I've, I've had reflexology treatments done in the past. I'm not quite seasoned in it to be able to talk like <laughs> informatively about it really, but in different sections of your foot and your toes is where it can help impact your organs or different areas of the body. So for example, maybe rubbing on the arch could be connected to your liver. I'm again, I'm just saying this as an example, but you mentioned the way our feet should be aligned. If we are conscious of that and every step we take when we're walking, it's almost like a reflexology treatment because we're activating all these areas and that's going to help deliver the life force. But in addition to just help complement the organs and different areas of the body because it's it's connected. Like we are so connected. And that was amazing to experience that treatment even from a knowledge standpoint because I'm like, how is this going to be helping my kidneys? How is this going to be helping my vision? Like this is connected to your diaphragm. Wow, okay, this feels blocked here. That's actually an indicator that maybe your diaphragm is a little bit blocked or glued. So, so much can be told in your feet about your general health. Well, and absolutely. And that's totally true. So when we are walking in perfect alignment, we'll just, you know, use those asterisks around that because none of us are that way. But when we can manipulate all of those centers of energy and get that impulse up the body, that's really what it comes down to. And fascinating. Yesterday, I was working on a patient of mine and I had two hours to work on her, but she basically wanted a full body treatment. So in two hours, we can cover a lot, but I can't cover every part, right? And she had very, very stiff ankles. So I worked on her core. She wanted, you know, some lots of time on her face as well. So I was able to spend maybe 15 minutes on her feet. So I thought of all the things that I could do, I'm going to work between the toes. And it was amazing because when I was going to just dorsiflex her foot, it was very limited in that range of motion. And as soon as I finished releasing the toes, it was like she had a completely different foot. And again, if we think about how the like, let's say like, again, here's, here's the foot and then here's the, the tibia. As we, go into a, as we go into a pronation, there is this drawing away of that tibia bone onto more of the forefront of the foot. So now we start limiting that ability for us to lift that foot up mm -hmm. and place that heel down. It also directs our body weight onto the balls of the feet when we should be having about 60% of the weight on our heels. So if you've got that tibia leaning forward, you can't put 60% of your weight on your heels because you're going to be tipping back. So we do a lot of the work with the feet where we're actually creating more of that space in the front of the ankle joint in through the whole foot itself. But then again, it really does come, and I keep learning this more and more, and I love this yoga retreat for this because she brought so much attention when we're in certain postures, lying on our belly, for example, splay your toes. And I'm, I'm really good at that because I've done so much work there, but I could splay my toes and put my pinky toes on the ground. Mm. I've got monkey feet. So, um, but that's what we want to do. We want to be able to have these toes that can move independently, just like our fingers, because again, they're the eyes of where we're directing our movement every, every moment. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, you're standing on something uneven and that proprioception, right, you go over that ankle. If we've got really good proprioception, the body will pull that ankle back before you actually go into that injury space. Mm -hmm. And the toes are the key. If we can again, grip, just, just like your hands. Like, you know, when you talk about so much when you're doing any kind of planks or push-ups, you know, it comes from the fingers, right? Like you want to engage those hands so that you're not just, you know, flattening the hands and then putting the stress on your, your shoulders. You want to really bring it in from that foundation and the toes are no different. So most people can, you know, move and mo uh, manipulate the fingers more because we use them all the time. However, we don't think about the toes. So if we're walking unconsciously with those pronated feet or supinated feet, they're just kind of hanging out there and they're not really an active participant in what's taking us forward in life and with our health in general. Well, and think about the footwear. 
yeah. people's shoes, the honestly, like it's almost, I'm going to make up a number here again, but probably like 95% of shoe companies aren't taking into consideration the health and the space of the foot. They're cramped. It's like grabbing duct tape and just wrapping it around your foot. Now saying, hey, lock your feet in this shoe, <laughs> the shoe prison for eight hours a day. And that can cause so many issues because you're literally blocking off the feet's ability and mobility as well as the toes. Now the toes are just losing that entire connection. So similar to if you are an avid walker, runner, sprinter, you weight train, you do squats, whatever it is like that. This is what really gets me when I see people going to the gym and they're not conscious of their alignment at all. And they're just like, Hey, well, I'm in high school. I got to put on weight size, get stronger for football or for hockey or whatever it is, or to impress girls, whatever, whatever your yeah. intention is, or your motivator, you need to really understand how to take care of your body, release the fascia, create unbelievable mobility, not even unbelievable, but just good enough so that you can actually work from that starting point. And then you can start building strength from that alignment. But people go to the gym and then they feel more out of alignment after they train. If you're working out properly, just like what you mentioned with the feet, if we're walking all the time, it's like a reflexology treatment. When you come back from the gym, you should actually feel more cemented in your proper alignment rather than feeling more collapsed and compressed. So that's the big difference between just people who are conscious and not conscious when they're weight training or doing anything. So that's such a big component is just release the feet, start strengthening the feet, like do exercises to strengthen the feet, spread the toes, and you probably won't be able to spread your toes your first time if you haven't done it, but that's where getting your fingers in between each of the toes, working there, finding the pain, the restriction, and starting to bring life back into that area. So I have a question because I, I see this, I might've mentioned this to you in the past quite a bit, but they're toe spacers. So I see a lot of other like personal trainers will recommend this where you pl I've never had them. I was contemplating buying them and just seeing like how they would work for me. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't think that they're a negative thing, but they're not going to unwind the fascia from the perspective of what we really want to do because a toe spacer isn't going to release those adhesions on the bone. It might give you a better sense of where your toes should be. But again, if you're super twisted, as soon as you take them out, you're you're going to be pulled back into that alignment that the fascia has. So I'm not saying like, don't try them or don't get them, but that's not going to be the corrector for what's going on up the chain. And remember how we talked about not that long ago, um, everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was just thinking like, it, it makes so much sense. You know, like if there's if there's a hundred people and somebody whispers and tells you a story in the first person ear, by the time you get to that hundredth person, how how true is that story, right? It's, yeah. it's probably a very different version from that initial input. Yeah. So similarly with the feet, as we relate that fascia pattern all the way up to the top of the head, you know, if our intention is to, you know, be strong and aligned, but we're twisted at the feet, that twisting is going to occur all the way up the body to the head. So then we get these spirals that gain more and more um, gravity or, or greater grooves in the fascia because of what's going on in the feet. So it might look like a little bit of a difference. Like if you're not walking perfectly with a push off, you might think, okay, like I've only got my foot maybe two degrees over to the right instead of pushing off perfectly compared to somebody that's really walking like a duck. However, that two degrees over a lifetime, that's going to start to add up every step you take and what that's going to do to manipulate everything at the top of the head. And it's, it's interesting because we're just kind of diving into this concussion protocol in our membership. And we're going to be talking about that in a couple of later podcasts. But we're really talking about, you know, the effect that the eyes have on us and how when the eyes are impacted, it's the gait that has to change. Because as soon as you block one eye, if you're walking around your house, you're going to change your gait some way to find this counterbalance. So I mean, everything is, I mean, moves from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top and everywhere in between, right? Like we're, we're this beautifully connected container 
and everything will manipulate everything else. But the fact that we step on our feet and we see in front of us, we age in that forward rotational direction and the feet are the things that are going to be absorbing what the eyes are doing as far as how we're aligned. And they're going to be manipulated from that point and perspective. So again, it's, it's really understanding that, you know, we have to look at everything with the fascia, but mm -hmm. the foundations are really, really important. And I love the fact that you brought up shoes because even if you're getting like really, really great shoes that are runners that have arches, as soon as you put your foot in a structure, then it's structured to what that shoe is. And it might be comfortable for the moment, but we're constantly moving and shifting and changing within our body based on life's forces and time and gravity and, and everything else. So if we're locked into those positions in our feet, the rest of the body is going to have to shift and counterbalance as a result of that. Like we really should be barefoot a lot. You know, I think there was a long time when people thought walking barefoot wasn't a good thing, but I mean, walking barefoot is your feet on the ground. You feel everything. You're able to understand, oh, my, my baby toe isn't involved in my gait. So you can start to sense that. I get so squeamish when I see the high heel shoes even more and more, especially with the points and especially when they're put on young girls. Because again, especially as we're growing, if we're manipulating our foundation, that's just going to impact things that much more negatively down the road. And I know that you don't wear high heel shoes, but correct me if I'm wrong, it's fine to wear them for an occasion once in a while, but to wear them, let's say to work, every day. That's where I really see some major issues being caused. Absolutely. And I think it's kind of like, you know, if you love eating a McDonald's burger, you know, have it once a month, don't have it every day. If you have it every day, that's going to be a problem. If you have it once a month and you're eating healthy, otherwise, then your body's going to know how to, you know, deal with the toxins coming in because we still want to enjoy life. And yeah, um, you know, to wear them to go to a wedding or or a dinner when you're seated. I mean, that's a very different thing. If you're walking around all day in high heels yeah. or shoes that are really restrictive, then it won't be long before you have a lot of issues. Absolutely. So there are those shoes where each toe has like a little slit where it can go into. Yeah. Do you, I forget. Do you have a pair of those? I don't have a pair of those, but I do have the barefoot shoes. Um, mm. or, or actually they're the zero shoes. Same, same idea though. Basically you're walking it. They're very spacious. They're actually too big for me. So I don't wear them that much, but cause I do go barefoot all the time, but I mean, I think those toe ones would be would be fine. I mean, they'd be really cool because it's you'd like be a able toe to spacer. Yeah, in a shoe. In a shoe, totally. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really cool idea. You should actually buy some and try them. I know that's. I've been thinking about that. Let's let's actually do that. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, yeah, then we can do a little uh, review on them. Because mm -hmm. I would love to wear those weight training. Because a lot of the time, I I'll take my uh, I'll take my shoes off when I'm doing squats and deadlifts and stuff. Nice. And if you do that work between the toes before you do that, that's going to really give you that sense of, okay, here's the ground, here are my feet, I'm in yeah. control of where my body's going. 100%. Well, I couldn't believe my ankle mobility after we did that section in that day at the intensive. It was it was incredible. And especially that I have so much scar tissue in my left. Yeah, actually share with everybody who might be hearing for the first time what happened to your ankle again so they know what you were dealing with. Yeah, I shattered my ankle biking um, I just kind of like flipped back trying to do a trick and then I shattered my fibula in seven or eight places, my tibia in like three or four. I see how I'm, I'm starting to forget to forget the details as well, but I was, I was pretty young. I was like 14 ish. And when you're growing and you have an injury, that's obviously not ideal. You can recover very quick, but now there's more scar tissue than that can manipulate how I'm growing. And yes, issues have surfaced from the result of my ankle, but I've been obviously been able to deal with it. So I have a ton of scar tissue in there. I have no pins, no plates, no screws. It's amazing. The surgeon was phenomenal. He was able to take out the three pins after like when I was able to uh, let I was walk. there when they took them out. Oh, that was a... It was gross. Well, <laughs> they said I was going to be in the boot for, or sorry, the cast for up to three months. And I was walking in four weeks. And that was really cool because right after when I got back from the hospital, Deanna came over, started working on my thigh, worked on my foot just to really increase the uh, blood flow, the circulation down there, pump out the stagnant inflammation and bring in the new. <laughs> and then of course, Deanna, uh, you've probably heard this on, on one of our episodes before, but Deanna got me to stand up and apply pressure on my broken foot. Again, not 
recommending that you just do that if you freshly sprint or freshly broke your ankle. But with Deanna's guidance, I was able to do that. And the pressure is very healing. And we go to the extreme when with pretty well everything. But if we're injured, like when I broke my hand, I was working on it right then and there. I didn't go and get it looked after and my hand's perfectly fine. So one of our uh, instructors uh, three days ago posted in Breathe and Believe that she um, was sitting cross-legged and her leg went to sleep and then she got up and she walked on it and twice went over and she wow. thought she fractured it. So she posted in Breathe and Believe and I reached out to her right away. So we got on a Zoom call and it was awesome because first of all, um, there's something called the percussion test to, to know if there's a fracture. And again, never suggesting not to go see the doctor, but sometimes you can't in the moment. It might be in the middle of the night. You might not be able to get somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So the percussion test is if you hit a bone at a distance from where you think the fracture is, if it's fractured, it's going to shoot pain because the bone is open and the nerves are going to fire. Mm -hmm. If it's not fractured and it's just soft tissue damage, you can tap at a distance and it's not going to send that shooting mm -hmm. pain. So from that percussion test, it did not look like it was fractured, even though she thought it might be just because of the level of pain and the inflammation. Mm -hmm. But right away, we had her working on it. I had her getting her hands involved. I had her working between the toes. Then after we got to the point where she's like, wow, it's already starting to feel better. Then I had her standing up and very, like we go through grades, right? Where again, you slowly start adding pressure with the breath and then you start putting more weight as you can. And then she was walking around a little bit. So next day she was like, this is outstanding, like so much better. Mm. So had that been handled in a different way, again, primarily because when we're dealing with the feet, that's where the um, circulation is the least effective because it's the furthest from the engine. So feet can take a very long time to heal. And that Jones fracture, that fifth metatarsal fracture, that's very common. Mm -hmm. um, often they need to put pins in that bone because it is so slow to heal and often doesn't heal well. However, by keeping your feet healthy and doing this work on your feet, that changes the game. Yeah. So for her to be able to like share the next day that, wow, like hardly any pain left, that was so exciting. And, and so now, I mean, again, had she taken the traditional approach, she could probably be, you know, on crutches for two weeks. And then her whole body's got to be dealt with because of all that crazy um, Compensation. compensations. Yeah. And, and what that's going to do up the body. So to be able to just, you know, understand that. Um, and again, like if we're talking some major other fractures, like, of course, you've got to go and you've got to do what you got to do, but you can still manage it in any way that you can in complement to what your right. medical practitioners are telling you to do. Yeah, no, that was very well explained. We should have her on maybe a discussion, even a short form, just to chat about that because it's really cool. We will. Uh, Good idea. Yeah, because even if I put out a video talking about a sprained ankle, I can get a boatload of views, but a ton of comments saying this is the last thing you want to do. And I'm pretty well saying, hey, do you know what? You don't want to apply the ice right away. And we've already done a podcast on this. So we won't go too deep down this, this path, but that's slowing down the inflammation, which is the healing. So why are you intentionally slowing down the healing? And then I have exercises to follow using your breath as your guide. And it's just very foreign to people because yeah. we're pummeled with, this is the wrong thing to do. Do the rice technique, rice or rest, ice compression, elevation. And even the doctor, Gabe Merkin, who coined the term rice in 2013, retracted what he was saying with the rest and the ice components saying, yeah. Hey, you know what? Ice actually can prolong the healing and even resting it too much can prolong it as well. Now, obviously you're going to need to rest it. I'm not saying just start running, but start taking these conscious uh, precautions or I not ideas, but just some sort of approach that they can follow so they're, they know what to do because you don't want to just leave it there either. You got to start working on it, pumping out the inflammation, yep. bringing in the new, et cetera. So it's like anything. If we treat if we treat people like they're fragile creatures, they will be, mm. you know, like it's the, the strongest trees are the ones that are in the, the windiest places because they're having to constantly adapt to the forces of nature. And then the more forces they are, the stronger they become as a result. So, I mean, our bodies are the same. And I just want to relate because I find it really comical. And now that we've done this estheticians program um, and I'm talking with Jane about this stuff, we, we mentioned this for, for women they always, well, not for just women, but I mean, they're always basically saying that the tissue under the eye is like so fragile. So like, you know, treat it with such like 
kid gloves and there's the most expensive eye creams out there of all the products, like the eye creams are the most expensive. It's not fragile. It's only fragile because we treat it that way. What we actually need to understand, and this is some of the work we're doing with the concussion protocol, is getting deep inside the eye. And I'm not suggesting you do this until you see how to do it properly, but to pull that collagen up that got sunken down into the orbit that's holding everything and pulling everything so thin. That's why it's thin, but we can pull that collagen back to reconfigure that tissue around the eye so that there's not this area of the body that's weak. Like we are so strong. And if we treat the body with conscious intention for the fascia, then the cells respond. It's not about cell health. It's really about fascia health. The fascia dictates the, the health of the cell. Mm. You could be the healthiest eater in the world, but if you're collapsed and not breathing, your body will not be flowing properly and it all comes down to flow. Mm. So of course we want to do as many healthy things as possible, but without that breath and awareness of cellular alignment, we're going to be running in circles and you could be paying a ton of money and putting so much time into trying to be healthy when you're really just missing one of the most important components, and that is the fascia. Right. It's interesting when you're talking about pulling the collagen that is, or the stuck collagen in the eye orbit more so back to the surface because it, it can get more like spread thin. It's thinking of my brother when he, so I'm working on him right now because he had, or he hit a tree snowboarding and has a massive ball of scar tissue on the right side of his hip. But because that's been there for so many years and he didn't address it in the moment that he feels like he almost has a hernia, an inguinal hernia. And what I was saying is all of this tissue now had to be pulled to where that injury was. And that's causing that scar tissue and that's stealing or robbing some, like a lot of that tissue where his hip flexor and inguinal ligament is. So it's more spread thin, making it more susceptible to have a hernia. So he said, you probably don't even have a hernia, but if you do, we just have to bring that tissue back so that it can actually start to rebuild where you're feeling that hernia, but that's not where it's caused. And it's really the collagen. And it's interesting because I mean, so many people are talking about like, you know, taking collagen and, and, and that's all good. But the thing is, we have in our fascia a balance of elastin and collagen. And if we're perfectly aligned, it's dis there's an equilibrium to those proteins to give us, again, mobility and stability. But then, yes, we have an injury and then the collagen. Like So like if there's an impact, basically the collagen in the fascia is going to push back with that equal and opposite force as a protective measure. If, again, we address it right away, then we release it. The collagen migrates back to where it's supposed to be. But if we don't, then it stays there. And then so there's areas in the body that become too hypermobile, and then there's areas that are hyper-restricted. So it's all about the imbalance. So just to take collagen, that's not going to change the game. We need to release those concrete areas where that collagen migrated to create those false walls and false floors so that we can pull it back through that conscious awareness of bringing back our foundation into alignment and then bring that equilibrium in the body back. Mm -hmm. And then that's really, you know, what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Going back to the feet, uh, we, we were also talking about, I believe it was our orthotics at the teacher intensive and how some people will wear orthotics. And yes, they can be a benefit to people at that time. But once you start integrating this work, you start releasing the compression in your feet, in your ankles and your calves all around your body and then you start strengthening your feet that's when it can lead to I don't really need orthotics anymore maybe they're actually causing more harm than good at this point and it's not saying as I mentioned <laughs> to reiterate they're not bad in the moment if you really need that and if you're unconscious but as soon as you become conscious of the feet and start working with it your body will likely start giving you little hints that you don't really need that as much. Maybe they're causing you a little bit more pain than they used to. And that's actually kind of an evolution of you. You're able to now rid the cane, we'll say, yeah. and now you're walking without the limp. You're walking without the orthotics. And well, and that like speaks directly to that leg length difference. So yes, if you have fractured, say your femur, you might actually have an actual 
leg length difference. But the majority of people that have a functional leg length difference, it's because of alignment. Mm -hmm. So when we've just, again, think of the flat tire on the car. If the tire's flat, that part of the car sinks to the ground. So now, is there an issue with the car? No, there's an issue with the flat tire. So when that pronation happens and it starts pulling away from the body, now we're having to adjust in the pelvis and there's a pelvic tilt from one side to another. So now we have a functional leg length difference. So that's where then an orthotic comes in. Oh, well, let's give you a lift. Now you're supporting the dysfunction, which is only going to continue to accumulate over time. And that's going to create more and more problems. So yes, as soon as we get rid of the um, dysfunctions in the feet and we bring that balance back in, then the orthotics don't make sense anymore. Right. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So, mm. And that's an exciting part, point. And we've had many of our community members say goodbye to the orthotics because they've now found their feet again. Yeah, that, that's really cool to uh, hear more than one person say that. Yeah. And then you, then you start knowing that this is really true and it's really working. But I didn't start bringing a lot of my awareness to the feet probably until maybe two to three years ago. Of course, I would block my feet, but I just wasn't as conscious. I don't know. And now even even just having this conversation, I bet you a lot of people have been like, oh, I'm going to start like moving my toes around, I'm spread the toes, <laughs> like I'm going to grip my feet. But we, we talk a lot about that even on our YouTube videos on the Block Therapy YouTube channel or my YouTube channel, Quinn Castling. We, we talk a lot about even how to strengthen your feet. So of course, releasing it, strengthening it. And then we should be able to move in all directions without much risk of injury. So when we start a creating that strength and understanding where that neutral alignment should be, we're free to go out of our ranges and come back, yes. strengthen our body consciously out of alignment so that we can actually come back. So I'm not saying go to the gym and perform deadlifts with a round back. That's not what I'm getting at, but there's a time and a place where you can do things like this. If you are at that level of consciousness awareness of your body and proper strength. And that can take some time. So that's why it's so important to start from the micro foundations to lead to the foundations and then you build from there. And so much of it really starts with the feet. So this is a, a slightly random thought, but we had a discussion with Sue Hitzman, mm -hmm. who is the founder of the Mel Method. And it was an awesome conversation. And I think what she's doing is great. And it's a fascia release technique as well. Obviously they're different. Her approach is different, but what's interesting is she would, I think majority of the time, if not all the time, have people start using her balls on her feet and her hands. So our approach is slightly different. So we start primarily with the breath yeah. and then we want to make sure that that engine's actually working properly. We're oxygenating the body, which is only going to make it more efficient to release the connective tissue all the way to the feet. But then we almost kind of travel down to start. We open up the, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. We have to open the channels from, from where that engine is, because again, if you're and everybody's different, but I mean, a lot of people, their legs are in a total deep freeze. You know, like if your calves, if you can't palpate them so they feel soft when they're relaxed, if your feet are blue and always cold, I mean, we've got circulatory issues and everybody to some degree likely does because mm -hmm. we're sitting too much, we're slouching, we're not standing properly. And it's the breath that drives the fluids, that drives the heat. So when we're doing the work, we're working to create that blood and oxygen flow to those cells as well as pull away the toxins and the, the waste. If we don't have that breath to support it, then we'll still probably make progress, but that's where the magic lies. It lies with the breath and, and that's turning on the body's furnace so that we can actually be super efficient at getting that blood flow. So for somebody that's really active, you know, that has good circulation in general, um, they would probably have more benefit, just not more benefit than that, but getting to the feet, they'll have a different right. result than somebody. And we've got so many people in our community that are literally in deep freeze mode because they're so frozen in that breath. And that's the key. I mean, I, I truly believe that this is the most important thing is to free up this beautiful mechanism because it also dictates what we can handle. When we understand our breath, we know our limitations. Through your breath, your breath is your guide. Um, you can trust that. 
Mm. Doesn't mean we won't have healing crises that might be really painful or uncomfortable or like suddenly you got a full body rash because you're jarring up what's inside and your body is moving it out. But you can trust that your breath is your guide. So if you're bending over and lifting up something heavy, if you hold your breath, now you're asking your cells to work and or you're asking your fascia to work and it's going to give on you. And that's when we get injured. Mm -hmm. If we're using that breath and we're trying to exhale, if we can't lift it, you won't be able to lift it if you're breathing where you hold your breath and you might get that impulse of, okay, I've just got that adrenaline rush and you lift it and you might get it off, but then your back goes out and now you're out for a while. Right. And I just want to clarify on that because that's a really good point. And I 100% agree with what you're saying about holding your breath. There's a lot of people who would be power lifters where they intentionally create intra-abdominal pressure to help protect the spine and the back when they're doing a big lift and it'd just be like one repetition at a time. So what they would do is they would expand the diaphragm and create this pressure around the spinal column, hold it, perform the squat, and then they would exhale. And they say that a can help with strength, but it can also help actually protect your back because you're creating that intra-abdominal. It's like bracing the core and breathing diaphragmatically. So yeah. rather than having a brace and inhaling on the way down, exhaling on the way up. That's what I do. I do that. I don't hold my breath through a full repetition. A, I don't have any intention of trying to lift 400 pounds anymore. <laughs> There's no need for it. But what are your thoughts on that as an exception if they're trained in that? Uh, well, you know what? I've never done that and nor would I see a point in doing <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's, so that's the thing. Like, I mean, like there's extreme sports and, and they're that, that very well may be the only way that they can do that and keep them safe. I don't know enough to speak on that right. though. No, no, that's, that's a good point. But in general, anybody who's going to lift anything up, you always want to be a connecting to the foundations, the root, the feet, everything, and always exhaling as you are lifting or pushing through that concentric movement. A hundred percent agree. Um, so what about feet? A lot about feet. And again, we really can't give them enough attention. I mean, you know, for women, we might go once a month to get a pedicure and, you know, make them look pretty, but we really don't give them credit for mm. carrying our entire body through our life every step of the way. Like what is more important if, I mean, people live wonderful lives that might not be able to walk through life, but to be able to walk through life is a gift that we're mm. given and to be able to look at these incredible feet that have 26 bones and so many ligaments and tendons and, and all these things to create what we should be able to do with them. We just don't give them credit for that. And if we actually can turn our attention to the feet and do some simple things, the rest of your body is going to be so grateful. And you're going to like, as an example, so after my yoga retreat, I actually tweaked my back on the, the last day before we had to dive into the hurricanes. So, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was interesting. And since then, I've been a little stiff in my back. So I'm waking up, I'm stretching it, I'm blocking, I'm doing all these things. But, you know, it's funny how we forget in ourselves what we're supposed to do. I'm way better at telling others what to do yeah. than looking at my own body. So then I'm waking up this morning and I'm like, geez, my back, it's already been a week and I'm still a little stiff. Like, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, let's go block the feet. Holy smokes. I, I blocked the feet actually for probably 10 minutes each foot. And wow, I walked away and I'm like, okay, that was all I needed to do was address my feet. Did you do top of foot, bottom of foot? I did the bottom of the foot and I also did around the heel. I was just kind of looking for the pain, but I didn't do the yeah. top. I was I was focused really on the bottom and getting to those things because we did so much work and created so much change, but I wasn't blocking when I was there because we were doing yoga the whole time and there was mm -hmm. no time to do anything else. I mean, we we, yeah. we yoga'd, we ate and we crashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. then I got home and we dove into crazy, crazy week. So I haven't had much time for self-care. Been a busy week. It's been a very busy week. And then to have just, again, that 20 minutes where I focused there and then to walk away with no back pain, I thought, wow, like again, I mean, it's it's just beautiful when you, when you remind yourself how yeah. impactful this work is and what we can do to change that. Well, and, and, and there you have it. Like, even though... Well, it's just showing that we're human. We still experience pain and things like this happen. Yeah. I kinked my neck a few months ago, at, which originated from an old bodybuilding injury probably eight years ago. And it just keeps reminding how I like to view it, at least just to keep my ego in check a bit. It's deeper. I'm getting to deeper layers. And then sure, I probably did certain things unconsciously. I probably threw too much weight around that I shouldn't have, or maybe I slept on it funny, whatever the 
the issue was, but I feel like every time I'm getting to a deeper level of it, and then it forces me to understand what it's like to be in what it seems like chronic pain. When you, when you're in constant pain for days and there's no relief, it's the worst. Yeah. Like it is the worst, but I forget that at times because I don't live in pain. You forget that at times because you don't live in pain. It's also a really good reminder that what so many people are actually going through and then that gives us the empathy to other people to realize that, hey, when we are in pain, we even forget at times what to do. Like we're human. That's just how we're designed, but we're trying to get smarter um, and better at this as time goes on. And yeah, I had, to, I had to rip my body apart and I tried out new things to see how fast I could rid the kinked neck and I got over it really quick and it was really cool. And yes, I had to work in my hands, <laughs> you know, like- yeah. It's like feet to the pelvis, arms to the shoulders. Yeah, exactly. And that's... Uh, and that's such a good point. And, you know, that really is, I think, our intention here because so many people are suffering and struggling and they might be doing what they are told to do and they might be following it to the nth degree and they might not be getting out of pain and it is no fun to live in a pain-filled life. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, pain is an educator and if we can see it as a language of the cell and we can use it for that purpose and we have a roadmap to heal, then it's a blessing to understand it. But for those that don't understand, that's why we're here. We really just want to share that you don't have to be in pain or at least to the level of pain that you're in. When you start addressing your fascia, getting your breath strong, understanding how to support proper foundation, then everything's going to change mm -hmm. and you're going to move in a better direction. Well, and, and, and it was funny because when I had the, had the kinked neck, I'm like, okay, I, I am going to try blocking my calves <laughs> just to see if it helps and doing maybe five, 10 minutes each calf getting pretty deep. Yes. You feel a release. Yeah. I'm not going to say it fixed it within that moment, but wow, did it cause a relief? Did it cause a release? And the, it, again, it's just another like, little aha moment to like, Hey, <laughs> we teach this. Yeah. Got to integrate this in. And funny because I was just doing a podcast earlier and we were talking about when you're sitting cross-legged and your knees can't come down to the ground. And so I was explaining, like if I took your hand and I pulled in and internally rotated it and then tried to lift my shoulder, this is the range that I have, where if I bring it into right alignment, then I've got this optimal range. So when the fascia winds around the calf and manipulates that foot in pronation, that's what's locking your hip and knee out of alignment. So everybody's working mm. on the hips because they're like, I want to get my hips to the ground, mm. but we got to address the feet and the calves. Otherwise, all that work on the hips is, you know, just kind of going in circles. And this is where it can get a little confusing or complex for some people. So I see a lot of stuff online when it comes to corrective exercises, things you can do to help you with back pain or really any kind of issue in the body. And so many people will say and preach that your back pain is caused from your hips. And I'm not disagreeing with that by any means, but there's also a cause to the hips. Exactly. So this is this is the complexity behind it where it's yeah. like, okay, well, you have back pain, but yes, that could be caused from the hips, but maybe that's caused from the feet, then that tweaked the knees and that pulled the hip out of alignment. And now you've been walking or sitting or whatever you've been doing for X amount of years incorrectly. And then boom, your back gives out. Yeah. And then also issues up the chain can affect your back pain as well. And we have to understand that we need our pelvic floor, we need our feet, and we need our diaphragm pretty well parallel to each other. Yep. So if you have an anterior posterior pelvic tilt, practice more of that neutral alignment. Similar with the lift. if you have that, what are your feet doing? Exactly. Because they are going to be what is going on here. Totally. Yeah. And that's, it's actually almost a similar topic or way of thinking through the Schultz bands, through the seven fascia bands, how they're like these linear stacked horizontal yes. bands throughout the body. And then it's the chaos lies between that. So uh, between well, the feet, yeah. yes, between the feet, the knees, the hips to the low back or whatever. It's like, where's that chaos going on in between those areas as well? Um, one more thing I wanted to mention, and then we'll wrap up this episode, but it's interesting how many toxins are also stored in the feet. Because when I went to get like some of my blood work done from uh, my herbalist, this was years ago, they were talking a lot about the feet and how many toxins are stored. And maybe even you as a, a viewer, even you, Deanna, have seen the 
have seen these videos or these ads on Facebook or Instagram. It's kind of like a foot tub. You put it in. Oh, I've done those. Yeah, those foot detox baths. But where it has like you plug it in and then it like draws it out and it's like black. Looks like pollution. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been. I've done them. I'm. I'm like. I want to do that so bad, but it's. I just know I'll be so disgusted when I look at that foot water. You'd rather it out of you. Trust me. Yeah, it's very <laughs> true. But let's say you have a frozen foot, and then you have somebody that's been actively working their feet. And you're wanting to do a detox bath. Now, I have my own version of doing a foot soak through the Alka bath yep. that I get from my herbalist. Mm -hmm. And they're, they consist of eight different stones that are very powerful at drying out toxins from the body. And you can only think how much more beneficial your feet will detox if you're doing these types of foot soaks totally. when they're open and spacious. Yeah. Now, they're actually allowed to detoxify much more e efficiently compared to if they're just frozen and rock solid. Now, of course, you'll get a benefit if they're frozen and rock solid, but it's even great to do a foot soak, have your foot warm, and then start doing some fascia release and decompression in the foot. Absolutely. Like think like we're, we're sitting in a room here and think if there was like smoke coming into the room and we had like one tiny little window to open, you know, how long it's going to take to be able to get the smell of smoke out or take the ceiling off and then suddenly everything can just leave mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah. So that's what space does. It allows for ease of things to leave as well as come in. So we want that space. Otherwise, yeah, the more frozen we are, the less space there is, the longer it's going to take to detoxify. And that's where that breath comes in so strongly, mm -hmm. as well as understanding that, you know, in the process that we have in our starter program, we work from that cord down through the extremities to the ends. And then then once we've gotten that body generally open and the breath strong, then we really start and focus more on that foundational piece and work our way from the bottom up. Well, it's amazing how powerful the breath is at detoxifying the body. Even so somebody has bad breath, for example, majority of the time, it's not just something that they've, they've eaten. No, it's caused from likely a sluggish liver or issues in the gut. And then that's literally traveling up into their lungs and then that's what they're exhaling out. And that's what you're smelling. Yeah. And it's it's kind of gross. Well, it is gross when you think of it <laughs> <laughs> like that. But it also shows you how important the breath is at detoxifying. Because if you're not exhaling fully and you're just breathing in the upper lobe of your lungs, that's all you're really doing. You got it. This stuff's trapped. This stuff is coming from deep in the gut. And you have to be able to bring that up and out. So. It's gravity, right? Like you were talking about how much is stored in the feet. It's because when we're standing, gravity's pulling everything to the ground. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have that strong pump to move things up and out, then it keeps accumulating, accumulating. And I mean, yeah. that's why like, you know, with, you see with diabetics, I mean, the, how many people end up with, you know, amputations because they don't have mm -hmm. any life in their feet. That's the first area to go. It's the furthest from the life source. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Well, this is a very cool talk. Yeah. All about the feet. So death starts in the feet. That's a phrase. I know we mentioned that at the beginning of the podcast. So if you haven't done any work on your feet, hopefully this motivates you a little bit more to really focus on them. And honestly, if you, you know, just want to give it a try, the first thing I would do is we've got so many videos show, sharing how to breathe diaphragmatically. Start there, do that for three minutes. And, and get this those, is on YouTube. And yeah, and get those fingers check between check. your toes, three minutes each. You can't rush it because you can't rush melting. And that's the point. So, you know, put on a show, whatever, so you can be entertained and then connect enough where you feel a little pain as your breath allows and spend three minutes. And we're not rubbing. We're simply placing in and holding, put pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, in the fingers, you can do this too. Like you can just like, you know, move your fingers into each other this way, yeah. interlock. And boy, oh boy, there's pain. Oh, totally. I mean, I get between the third and the fourth one. I had uh, when I was three, this finger. That's the worst one. Were, yeah, awful. Um, but there's a lot of pain in through here. However, again, same thing. This is a way you can release the fingers and, you know, keep everything up the chain from the arms up to here in a better space. Yeah. But just do that stuff because it doesn't take time, really. It's simple to do. Well, and you you said it, right? You can be watching a show. You're already dedicating 30 pull. Shows are more like an hour now on Netflix. So I'm watching a show. I'm right. settling in for an hour. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you may as well do something for your good, for your benefit while you're relaxing so and then afterward you know when you're walking just stand up and grip that floor you know bend those knees slightly grip the floor and hold for 10 breaths and then 
So now you've released. Now you want to own that space. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice right after you'll feel it. So it's not going to be like, oh, I've got to do this for weeks on end to actually feel it. You, I guarantee, will feel it after the first time you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that wraps up this episode. That was fun. So that was a ton of fun. Yeah. The feet. So if you are looking for more information, uh, you can check out our YouTube channels. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, then you're already there. <laughs> um, if you want to check out some of my YouTube stuff, it's very similar. I incorporate a little bit more strength training and and corrective exercises. Uh, that's under Quinn Castellane. You can check out our website, blocktherapy.com. We have free gifts and stuff that you can check out as well. We even have our sampler program. It's $9 teaches you how to use a rolled up towel um, as your tool. And it, that's amazing how well that works as well. And that's where you can find us and a lot of information. If you want to connect and join a community, go to Facebook, type in Block Therapy Community, ask to join. We have over 10,000 members in there now. So there's lots of support and lots of people that are doing block therapy or just wanting to learn more. So other than that, have an awesome rest of your day. We'll see you in next week's episode. Bye, everyone.